Welcome to this PowerPoint presentation on organizational structure. In this presentation, we're going to learn about how organizations decide to organize themselves. How an organization decides to arrange its different departments and connect them influences everything else that happens in an organization. An organization structure influences virtually everything that happens there. For example, organizational structure will have an impact on the organizational culture, sometimes called the organizational climate. Think of culture and climate as being the personality of the organization. Uh, what makes it different than other organizations that might be in the same line of business? Some researchers use the term culture and climate in different ways. I'm gonna consider them to be uh, synonyms of each other. Organizational structure will have an impact on the nature of organizational conflict. What kinds of problems is the organization going to have? Uh, what groups are going to be competing with uh, what other groups? Uh, what groups are going to be uh, struggling for the same resources? All of these things can be influenced by the kind of structure the organization has put in place. The organizational structure will have an impact on how quickly people plateau in their careers. We'll talk about plateauing in a later slide, but uh, the short version is that at some point you kind of stop getting promoted and you end up staying at the same level for the rest of your career. That's what plateauing is all about. The structure will also have an impact on how pervasive something called the Peter Principle is. We'll also talk about this in a later slide, but again, the short version of this is uh, you keep promo getting promoted in jobs until you reach a level where you're no longer competent, and then you're destined to stay there at your level of incompetence. That's what the Peter Principle is all about. The type of communication problems an organization will have can be very dependent on its structure. Who is left out of the loop? Who communicates directly with whom? All of these things are dictated by the structure. And when the organization needs to change, the difficulty of making that change will depend very much on the structure that's in place. The structure of an organization re results from decisions that are made about six basic issues. Sometimes there is no overall plan for organizational structure. It just sort of happens because of decisions that are made about these specific issues. One of these issues is work specialization. How narrowly defined are the jobs that people are doing? How finely do you slice up the labor that goes into any tasks? So for example, if somebody is working on an automobile assembly line and the only thing they're doing is screwing the left side rear view mirror onto the side of the car, and that's what they do all day long as the cars come down the assembly line, this is a very highly specialized job. The person doesn't need a lot of different skills. Uh, the person has no variety in the work that he or she does. So that would be an example of a highly specialized uh, work situation. On the other hand, you might have jobs in an organization where the person is responsible for a variety of different tasks and not just one. In that case, uh, the work is not so highly specialized, but the decision that's made about uh, the degree of work specialization is going to matter and it's gonna have an effect on the organizational structure. Departmentalization. How do you decide which jobs get grouped together in a single department? We'll talk more about departmentalization in a moment when we get to a different slide. Another decision that has to be made is about chain of command. Who answers to whom in the organization and how firmly set is that? Can you go over your boss's head or is there no way uh, to communicate with anybody higher up except through that individual? Span of control. What is the appropriate size of a group reporting to a single supervisor? In other words, how many different employees should any single manager be responsible for overseeing? We'll talk more about a uh, span of control in a moment. Centralization and decentralization. How much is authority delegated among different groups of jobs, uh, among different managers, or how much is 
uh, decision making done just at the top. One centralized authority who just passes the message down the chain and uh, nobody else really has too much say over what happens. Decisions about centralization also have real implications for the kind of uh, structure that an organization will have. And finally, formalization. How formalized are the procedures that must be followed? How much discretion do employees have in figuring out how to get the job done? In a highly formalized organization, there are very strict rules and procedures that must be followed. Things have to be done in a certain way. In a less formalized organization, uh, employees are just kind of given this vague goal, get this done, and exactly how that gets done is pretty much up to the employee. So the degree of formalization will also have an influence on the organizational structure. Let's talk about departmentalization again. On what basis do we combine different jobs into a group or a department? The most common way of doing this is usually some sort of functional departmentalization. You group together all of the jobs that are basically serving the same function. So you might have an accounting department, a sales department, an engineering department, a human resources department, so that everybody who's working in sales is put together in the same department, everybody who's working in human resources is put together in the same department, and so on. Sometimes uh, departmentalization takes place functionally on the basis of product. So if I'm working for um, Quaker Oats, the cereal company, there's a life cereal group and there's a brand manager who's in charge of everything that goes on with life cereal. And then that um, department has all of the other functions that are in any way related to the life cereal. This would be another example of functional departmentalization. Territorial departmentalization means that the company uh, sort of groups things geographically. So you might have a Midwestern division of a large company. You might have a European division of a large company. And each division has its own president, its own human resources department, its own marketing department, and so forth. Each one of these territories, each one of these separate offices, have all of the functions. And this is good for training managers because people can stay in the same location and move from one kind of a job to another and learn about many different jobs within the company. Territorial departmentalization is probably less common than it once was. With the uh, ease of communication because of computers and Zoom and all of that other stuff, um, you no longer need to have all the functions in the same place. So it's less common to organize organizations on the basis of geography than it once was. There's also uh, customer departmentalization. You organize things um, according to what customers are going to be looking for. So if you go into uh, a Target or a Walmart or some such place, you have an automotive department where everything that has to do with cars is located in one place. You have a sporting goods department where everything that's related to hunting and fishing and sports of all kinds are grouped together. You have a toy department. You have a, a women's uh, clothing department. You have a shoe department. So you're grouping things together based on what customers want. I deal with a lot of publishers in my job as a professor, and publishers often have separate um, representatives for popular press books than for textbooks than for scholarly books. And so they organize the divisions within the publishing company based on the type of customer they're gonna be dealing with. A lot of uh, companies also have some kind of mixed departmentalization where it isn't purely any one of those ones that I just described, but it's a little bit of one and a little bit of another kind of uniquely put together in a way that you don't see in other companies. So it is possible to mix and match these things to some extent. So now let's talk about span of control. How many people should report to a single manager or supervisor? This is important for a lot of reasons. First of all, it affects the amount of contact between the manager and the employee. If I'm a manager and I only have three employees working for me, 
I'm probably going to have a lot of face time with each of those individuals. On the other hand, if I'm a manager in charge of 100 employees, the amount of time I'm going to be able to spend with any one individual is very limited. So uh, there's not going to be as much personal contact between managers and workers if you have a very wide span of control as opposed to a very narrow span of control. Span of control also may determine the effectiveness of different leadership styles. You may have to lead and manage in a completely different way if you're in charge of 100 people than if you're in charge of only three people. Just like a professor uh, will probably teach very differently in a small class with eight or 10 students as opposed to a large lecture class with 100 students. Span of control dictates the kind of communication patterns that happen. How easily is it going to be for employees to communicate directly with their manager? And which employees are going to be able to communicate with which other employees, depending upon the size of the group? So when you put together an organizational chart, one of the first things you notice is the span of control. So as you can see in this diagram here, each person um, has a line attached at the top and the bottom of the body, uh, indicating uh, who they answer to and who answers to them. And you'll see that some people have broader spans of control than others. And the organization has a certain structure based on how you've decided to manage this. And organizations can have very different structures depending on whether they have a flat or broad organizational chart versus a more steep, narrow, hierarchical one. If you look at uh, Business A's organizational chart, you'll notice that there are many different levels and there are not very many individuals answering to each manager. And so um, as you move up the level, there are a lot of levels to go through before you get from the bottom of the hierarchy to the top. Business B, on the other hand, has a much broader, wider span of control. So each manager has more people answering to him or her, but there aren't as many levels. There aren't as many steps between the bottom of the hierarchy and the top. And life in these two kinds of organizations can be quite different. For example, it's going to be a lot easier to get promoted in business A because there are more levels to be promoted to. In business B, if this is the whole organization we're looking at, well, after you get that first promotion, uh, that's going to be it unless you eventually become the CEO at the top. Now let's talk about the concept of centralization. How much do the powers on the top delegate authority to managers that are lower in the hierarchy? A highly central organization does not have very much delegation of authority. Almost all the decision-making goes on at the top. A decentralized organization, on the other hand, allows lower-level middle managers to actually have quite a bit of say in what happens. They get to make some real decisions. Now, there are certain advantages to being decentralized. Uh, the lower-level managers have more autonomy, and this usually makes them happier. People like feeling like they have some choices over how they do things, and so their job satisfaction is going to be higher to the extent that they have more decision-making authority. However, uh, this creates more competition as well because there is some freedom to make the decisions. Uh, you'll be able to see which managers are good decision-makers and which ones aren't, and this allows the cream to rise to the top. Uh, people will vie for promotions with each other because they have some evidence of their competence. Another advantage of the decentralized network is that lower level managers get decision making experience so that if they finally do get into one of the top positions of authority, they're not trying to figure out how to make decisions for the first time. They've gotten a lot of experience with doing that already. Now there are some uh, disadvantages to decentralization. Uh, it requires more formal job training. So if you're going to put people in a position where they can make important decisions that matter, you're going to have uh, money riding on this and a bad decision by a manager lower on the scale uh, can cost the company a lot of money. So before you put people in those situations, you want to make sure that they're ready for it. So more job training is required in a less centralized network. Um, also, 
Um, managers sometimes don't like to delegate authority. And so if you have a decentralized work organization, the managers at the top may resist what they're supposed to be doing. And this can lead to conflict within the organization. Just for fun, let's take a look at a Knox College organizational chart. This is from a few years ago. So the actual design of the Knox organizational chart may have changed a bit since then. And certainly a lot of the names that you will see in the boxes here are no longer um, people that are no longer working in Knox and they would be new names in there. But uh, this will give you a flavor of how the college is put together. At the top, of course, you have Teresa Ahmad, who is currently the president. Although we're searching for a new president, Right now, this is 2021 when this slide show is being made. So there will be a new president in place next year. There's an executive assistant who answers directly to the president, as does the athletic director. Underneath that, you also have the Title IX co uh, coordinator, the director of sustainability, and the community and government relations person. They all do answer directly to the president. Underneath that, you have senior staff, and these are essentially vice presidents, and the vice presidents are each in charge of a certain uh, part of the college. Uh, the provost, the dean of academic affairs, is uh, now Mike Schneider, um, not Garakai Campbell. Uh, this is the uh, person who's in charge of the academic side of the college. So they're in charge of the faculty, and they're in charge of the educational program. Finance and Administrative Services, um, that vice president is in charge of sort of the money that's coming in and out of the college, getting the bills paid, making sure the heating bills and the insurance uh, is getting paid, getting the payrolls together and so forth. You have admissions and financial aid. You've got the Information Technology Service, uh, student development. So the admissions and financial aid people are responsible for getting the students to come to the college the student development part of the operation is a charge for kind of handling the non-academic life of students after they get here. Advancement is the uh, wing of the organization that's responsible for fundraising, raising money to keep us in business, getting donations from alumni and foundations. And finally, there's communications. This is a relatively new one. This did not used to be a vice president position. Um, the communications office is in charge of all of the information about the college that goes out into the world. So think of it as a public relations wing. Now, each of these boxes on this organizational chart has its own organizational chart uh, within each department. And I'll show you a couple of those just for ex an example. Here's one that many of you as students will be familiar with, the student development organizational chart. So the vice president in charge of this is uh, Ann Ehrlich and uh, Stacy Matten, or Matan, I'm not sure how you pronounce her name, is the executive assistant who answers directly to her. And then underneath that position, you've got people in charge of residential life, the dormitories, you've got the nursing and health services people, you've got the career center, uh, counseling services, uh, intercultural life, spiritual life, community service, and then underneath each one of those offices, you have a group of other people that help carry out the functions of that office. In admissions and financial aid, you've got Paul Stinas, who is the vice president. And then underneath uh, him, you've got uh, people in charge of uh, campus visits, uh, people in charge of uh, recruiting international students. You've got um, financial aid people, and they're all uh, dealing with the pipeline of students coming into the college in some way or other. As I indicated earlier, one of the things that the organizational structure has an influence on is the speed with which somebody will plateau in their career. So plateauing refers to the point at which an employee's career progress begins to stagnate. So when you graduate from college, if you go to work for a big organization of some sort, You'll start kind of at the bottom in a manager trainee program somewhere, but you'll probably have ample opportunities for promotion in your early years. Uh, if you stick with the company or the organization long enough, you will get promoted into the next level up. And if you're good there, you'll get promoted into the next level above that. But at some point, you get high enough in the hierarchy 
where there just aren't that many other places to be promoted to, and you begin to feel like you're stagnating. You go years without a promotion, and when you start seeing people who got into the company after you did getting promoted over you to higher positions, that's a clear sign that you're probably not going anywhere. So uh, it can be very difficult for people to come to terms with being plateauing, and it often coincides with that thing we think of as the midlife crisis, where the person feels desperate to make a change of some sort. So you will often see people trying to switch jobs at this point because they think that the only way to get ahead in their career is to move to a different organization and enter at a higher level. And sometimes they're right about that. But the structure of the organization that you are in, whether it's tall and narrow or broad and short, uh, dictates how soon this happens to you. And similarly, the Peter Principle. This is the theory that employees within an organization will advance to their highest level of competence and then be promoted to and remain at a level at which they are incompetent. When I was in college, the Peter Principle was a brand new thing, and there was a book uh, published by a guy named Dr. Lawrence Peter, hence the name, the Peter Principle. And at first, everybody thought it was kind of a joke. He was uh, making fun of how inefficient organizations are, and he was pretending that the reason this happens is that people were getting promoted. Uh, as long as they were good at a job, you got promoted out of it. But when you got into a job you weren't good at, you stayed there because they wouldn't promote you because you weren't doing good work. And so the organization was filled with people wallowing in their level of incompetence. Well, since the book came out, it's not thought of as a joke anymore. The Peter Principle is a real thing. And your textbook talks about the Peter Principle in some detail and discusses some of the remedies that organizations have developed to try to deal with it. And so to wrap this up, um, organizational structure matters. Organizations with loosely defined job descriptions, wide spans of controls, decentralized authority are very different from organizations that have gone the opposite direction with each of those options. Your textbook describes a variety of different types of structures that can result. Simple structures, bureaucracies, matrix structures, just to name a few. I've decided not to go into those in this presentation because it's already gotten long enough and I don't have anything to add to what you will find in your textbook. But uh, by all means, be sure to study those different types of organizations and uh, be sure that you'd be able to recognize which type it is if I were to describe an organization to you in a test question.